All right, hi everybody. Welcome, my name is Ann Vernon Gray and I am here from the Center for Undergraduate Research and Fellowships for this uh, behind the CV series that we're doing with MindCorp. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have uh, Roy Hamilton here with us. To, and ordinarily I would give a, a you know a protracted um, introduction uh, uh, about our speaker, but since that is the entire point of this particular session, I'm gonna let him do that. And it will be a rather unusual um, introduction because it is literally, as the name suggests, all the things that you don't see on a CV. So um, Heather already alluded to the fact that we want this to be an uh, open conversation. We'll let Dr. Hamilton uh, sort of give us his life, life story and all the tidbits of wisdom he wants to share. And then we'll open the floor for questions, which we hope you will feel free to, um, along the lines of the sort of Reddit phenom, ask, ask anything. Um, and if you would then prefer for it not to be included, we can absolutely edit that, uh, that out later of the um, podcast that this will um, turn into. So um, the sort of mission of this uh, Behind the CV series is to um, provide a forum for asking uh, questions that you wouldn't ordinarily ask in a sort of basic science focused um, presentation. So it can be about the work, but it can be about how people got from point A to B, or um, you know what they wish they had done differently, all and all the things in between. So, without any further ado, I will ask um, Roy to go. Great. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to do this, and um, I'm looking forward to the discussion with everyone. I think the way that I would like to go about this, I don't have any scripted comments, so I'm going to be ad libbing everything. But I think. Uh, what I'd like to do is start with a very brief summary of what I do at Penn and what I do generally, and then sort of go back through my history. And uh, hopefully in telling my history, it will sort of connect to and explain why I do some of the things that I, I do here. And, and the reason I want to do it that way is because uh, I think that uh, there, are, there are several components to what I do in the course of a, a day or a week. I, I wear several hats and I, I think that the history actually explains why I'm motivated to wear the different hats I wear. So that, so, so first I wanna explain the hats and then I'll show you how my head fits in them. Um, okay, so I am a uh, behavioral neurologist by training. I, um, uh, I see patients at the Penn Memory Center uh, here at Penn, where I've, I've been a clinician for the last 16 years. Uh, the patients I see primarily have neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's diseases, and other disorders of cognition. Although I also do see some patients who have vascular diseases of the brain, uh, vascular disease causing uh, deficits of cognition. I run a laboratory and uh, more recently, a center that engages in non-invasive brain stimulation. So that's uh, electrical and magnetic non-invasive stimulation of the brain. For people who are unfamiliar with the, those techniques, I basically, I mean, we can go into it more detail if you have questions, but I stick magnets and electrodes uh, on people's scalps and I discharge them. And uh, it turns out that you can do that to focally manipulate human cognition. So the, the lab I run, uh, we, we do that, we try to establish structure function relationships in the brain as they pertain to human cognition. And then we also try to import those insights into clinical patient populations with neurologic disorders that have cognitive deficits as their symptoms to try and improve those symptoms. All right, so that's my research in a, in a nutshell. We spent a lot of time focusing on people who have language deficits or um, aphasia, acquired language deficits, either because of neurodegenerative disease or because of stroke. A third hat that I wear is that uh, I am a, um, a, in a couple of venues, I would say, I, I'm a, a diversity officer and advocate uh, of the institution. So I am uh, one of the assistant deans in the program for diversity and inclusion in the Perlman School of Medicine. My formal title there is the assistant dean for cultural affairs and diversity. So I'm very uh, outward facing with respect to uh, the students and student leadership of various groups that have to do with aspects of identity, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism. 
Uh, and I also have for the last several years have been the vice chair for inclusion and diversity for the Department of Neurology. And so in that regard, I, I am the sort of lead advocate in the in that department um, for those same ideals. So let's let's go back now. So those are my hats. Okay. So let, let's go back now and talk a little bit about my story. And I'll I'll start way back. So um I am originally from Long Beach, California. Uh and I am the child of a Japanese immigrant mother and an African-American father. And um, my uh, mother uh, uh, came here uh, from Japan, sort of uh, it, it kind of made a, a clean break of her life, so to speak, came here with uh, an original intent to, uh, to get an advanced degree in English and do something in, in English or Japanese education. Um, met my dad, a, uh, at that time, a, a factory worker and uh, things just happened. And, they, uh, and so, uh, you know, a family was formed. Um, I have, the reason I'm, I focus a lot on my family in this first sentence, because it, it is motivating for what I'm about to talk about. Uh, so uh, when my mother married a black man in the United States, uh, that, that things being what they are with uh, race relations, that, that sort of uh, created a kind of um, distance with her family in Japan. And so I was raised um, with a, a, a black family, a sort of uh, uh, extended family, four, four half brothers, on my, you know, from my father, and um, uh, I'm I'm the first person in the uh, African American side of my family, the first American in, in my family to go to college, um, and so obviously the first one also to go to any kind of professional or graduate training, and the, the first one to 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 have an, a career in academia, and so. Uh, Turns out that influenced a bunch of things. So, so one of the things that that influenced was that um, you know I did well in school, obviously, and uh, got into you know applied to to various institutions for for college and um, got into a number of them. But it turns out that having a, a family where uh, you know none of my older brothers even graduated from high school, so I was the first person in my sibling cohort to graduate from high school. My my family. My, my father had only heard, no offense to Penn, and I, every time I tell this story, people get offended, uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say it anyway. Um, my father had only heard of one university in the country as, as having a, a, you know, a, it, it, so, so when I got into Harvard, that, that sort of was where I was going. I, I accepted it sight unseen um, for that reason, you know, because sort of having, it's it sort of really quite, epistemically limited in my in my decision right I had no idea what I was I was getting into I just you know had, our family had, had heard of it so so that was that check the box so then I went and um it was it, it was uh, obviously life-changing in a variety of different ways I mean I like to say I mean obviously college changes everyone's lives but um for me it was quite jarring um I had uh you know, and, and some of those ways in which it was jarring um, were, you know, physical. Like I, I was raised, born and raised in Southern California in a, in a lower middle class family. I, I, I had never, I had never seen or, I, or snow, you know, I never, I'd never been through an actual winter. Um, uh, the, as soon as the first one came along, I, I was convinced I made a horrible mistake in crossing over to the other side of the country. Um, I was afraid to, to go out to, to the dining hall to get my meals because it was so cold to me outside. Um, but but in addition to that, I was introduced to a just a variety of other things. I mean, aside sort of uh, just a level of uh, privilege and wealth and uh, expectation on the part of colleagues and the classmates that I, I, I'd never encountered growing up um, with the, the peers I had growing up. Um, but also, you know, a lot of academic opportunities, the, the opportunity to be in contact with um, people doing, you know, some of the, the most groundbreaking and, and fantastic work in their fields, you know, just on, just on a 
routine daily basis. <laughs> the, the, the people teaching my classes or the, the people whose, whose labs I was, uh, you know, taking courses in. So it was, it was, um, it was both fantastic and, and jarring. And in some ways, um, for the reasons I, I had said before, there were, there were definitely points of interpersonal friction. But um, overall, life changing, sort of in some ways, persona changing, um, and um, and a great experience. So uh, I started out just thinking a little bit more now about career formulation, career aspirations. I started out again pretty pretty epistemically limited. Like I did not know what I did not know, and I didn't even know how to ask the questions about the, the different career options and possibilities that were in front of me. And so let me say that I, I started out with a different career ambition. I did not start out interested in being a neurologist, a behavioral neurologist, or, or a physician at all. Uh, I actually started out interested in being a, a psychologist. And um, I have to say that that proceeded from, for the reasons I just mentioned, uh, you know, about my upbringing, proceeded from a pretty impoverished understanding of what psychologists do or what the spectrum of being a psychologist could entail. You know, so I, I went to college thinking that psycho psychologists were all like psychologists that you saw on TV and that, you know, I was going to be the kind of person who sat in a chair with his uh, legs crossed, scribbling on a notepad while someone else laid on a, on a uh, couch and talked about their mother. And um, so that, that was my conceptualization. Uh, and then I got to Harvard and I started taking classes in psychology. I was a psychology major um, at the time. I don't know if this is still the case. They don't call them majors, they call them concentration. So I concentrated in psychology. Um, and I started taking uh, just a range of classes. And one of them that really changed my life was um, what was then called psychobiology. Uh, nowadays, we would have called it something like um, introduction to brain and behavior or, you know, uh, something like that. But, you know, at, the, at that time in 1991, <laughs> 92, uh, they called it psychobiology. And so I took that and uh, just the idea that there was a neural basis for all these complex behaviors that I was interested in just blew me away. I mean, I, obviously I knew that the brain mediated behavior, but to be able to dissect it and understand it in a uh, more granular way, I thought was um, really the direction I wanted to go in. And so that kind of changed my life. And, and so um, I sub-concentrated within my concentration in, again, what then was called psychobiology, would, would, what would now be conventionally referred to as biological basis of behavior or, or, or perhaps cognitive neuroscience. And so, um, so that went on and I, I graduated. I um, took a year out of research. By then I started thinking about, uh, about, doing, about going to medical school, but, but still the, the bulk of my thinking was that I was gonna go to, uh, to graduate school, get a PhD and, and become a cognitive neuroscientist. I, I happened to um, get really lucky uh, when I was a senior and one of my thesis advisors or the sorry person on my my thesis committee Nancy Canwisher uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, Nancy Canwisher she's sort of an iconic figure in cognitive neuroscience uh, amongst the many things she did she was instrumental in um, developing evidence to support the notion that there's a, a particular portion of the brain that uh, is especially engaged in processing human faces so anyway um, she was on my thesis committee and, and spontaneously asked me if, if I knew what I was going to do in the next year. And I, I didn't actually have a plan. I had, um, <laughs> I, had, I had actually failed to get a bunch of consulting jobs and other things that uh, Harvard students who don't know what they're going to do, do with their time off before they go on to the next stage in their life. So I, 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 I knew I wasn't going to be a consultant for McKinsey and a bunch of other companies. So that's what I knew. I didn't know what I was doing. So she, out of the blue, offered me a position to be her research assistant. And so, uh, which, you know, I jumped at since I was considering getting a more research focused PhD. And that was good. Um, during that year, however, uh, I, I did come to some conclusions. I mean, relatively early on in the year. And one of them was, you know, as we were doing this 
really seminal work. Again, she's an icon in the field and I'm lucky, I feel fortunate to have had the experience of helping her, you know, develop stimuli in the, in the scanner that people were looking at to distinguish between face and non-face processing areas. It's fantastic. But, you know, the one thing that I, I, I didn't get from the experience was uh, a notion that anything that I would be doing uh, either in that lab or if I, for years at least, as I moved on to other work, if I followed that vein, would actually have direct applicability to the health and welfare of um, humans. And, and I, I think perhaps, um, and, and that's not to disparage sort of basic cognitive neuroscience, since you know uh, I, I work with a lot of cognitive neuroscientists who don't directly think about an application to human health. But you know, for, for me, thinking about someone who had originally come to this thinking that he was gonna be some type of clinician, um, you know, the idea that I wanted to do something where someone knew that I had helped them or they felt like they had been helped, you know, had, had purchased for me. So, so at that point, I decided that I was going to go to medical school and I applied to medical school. And um, at that point, still thinking I was going to be a psychiatrist. So I was like, okay, we'll just do a, just a little tiny lateral leap. Uh, and so I, I got into medical school. Uh, I got into some good medical schools, but um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, including momentum, um, having established some life for myself in, in, uh, in, in Boston, and also because, you know, it's not a shabby medical school. I went to Harvard Medical School. And um, so there, I had what I, I think is was a, a life changing mentorship event. So um, I, I got interested in a behavioral neurology. I, I saw just the agenda tacked up on a wall somewhere, you know, because this is back when people still use paper to announce things. I, I saw tacked up on a wall somewhere that there was going to be a um, behavioral neurology lecture series. And they, they showed the topics. I was like, oh, these are very interesting for a person who's interested in behavior and the neural basis of behavior. So you know, there I am, first year medical student, just sort of popping up at these various conferences, eating the free lunches and listening to lectures. And um, you know, one of the very early ones was somebody who had just come from the NIH, uh, gotten his first faculty position in a Harvard hospital, the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, his name was Alvaro Pasqualione, uh, MD, PhD, and a neurologist. And um, he did this amazing thing. You know, uh, he, he uh, had this device and it was a magnet and he could discharge it and he could discharge it next to your head and it would discharge so powerfully that it would cause the neurons in your brain to fire and you can move it around and focus on different parts of the brain and alter your brain function focally and cause you to behave differently and using that understand how different parts of the brain are related to, to behavior. And uh, I heard that lecture and I decided two things. I decided A, that was the person I was going to work for, and B, that's what I'm going to do. And so, um, and both of those things came to pass. So I, I approached him after the lectureship and said, you know, I, I'm a first year medical student. I really want to um, get involved, see more about your research. And and so I actually became his uh, his first student in uh, in his new laboratory, and I stuck with it there for. I guess three years. What what I did was, since I'm not a I'm not a PhD, I'm just, uh, I'm, just I, I'm an MD, but um, I did my I stayed there for my preclinical years, and then I uh, which is two. You know, you get in medical schools usually structured a couple of preclinical years and then uh, two clinical years. Although it's a little bit different here at Penn. So after my after my preclinical years, I uh, I went to the wards. I went to my clinical year decided, uh, A, that I was having a miserable time on the wards and that perhaps I had made a, a, a mistake and that I might have, might should have gone to, to graduate school um, and, and B, that I, I really wanted to do more research. And so actually, I, I, I kind of had a, a, an existential crisis in medical school once I got into my clinical year. I, I was having such a, a, just a malignant, miserable time um, being a, a, 
a, a medic sort of a clinical clerkship student, uh, you know, the, the lowest, the lowest rung on the ladder in the hospital, uh, that I, I um, decided that I would experiment with the idea of, uh, of possibly uh, backing out of medical school or at least trying something different for a while. So what happened was uh, there was a, you know, Harvard Medical School is, is broken up broadly speaking into, into two programs. There was one that was an MD program, sole MD program. And then there was a program that's primarily for MD PhDs, which is a partnership with MIT called the Health Sciences and Technology Program or HST. And when I got admitted to medical school, I got admitted to the MD program for, for medical students. But what I did was I, I transferred my membership, I transferred my status into the HST program. So I became an HST student, not a, not a PhD student per se, but I, I joined the HST. And one of the reasons why I did that, or the reason I did that, was that uh, HST students, because of the partnership with MIT, uh, had the option of taking MIT courses. So then what I did was I um, withdrew from all of my clinical clerkships. And uh, for the next year, I enrolled in all uh, graduate level courses in cognitive neuroscience at MIT, including the entire uh, first year graduate school sort of cognitive neuroscience or overview course, and then a bunch of elective courses on top of that. And so for all intents and purposes, during that time, I, I became a first year graduate student at MIT in, in cognitive neuroscience. And so, you know, all my classmates were the, the cognitive neuroscience uh, graduate students of, of MIT. And um, let me cycle back to my mentor, Alvaro, because uh, we came up with an arrangement uh, actually proposed by him, which was that he, he thought that my work in the lab was valuable enough that, uh, that you know, we agreed that, that that would be my main site where I would continue to do my research during that year. Um, but also that he would cover, instead of, instead of paying me to work in his lab full time, that he would actually cover the, the tuition component for, for MIT, all right? And so I took this year out and of course I had living costs and whatnot, but the, the, this uh, thing which could have otherwise been a quite a, a expensive experiment <laughs> turned out to not be because of, of a, a mentor who, who valued my work. And so um, I spent the year at MIT and for those of you who, you know, I, I, I actually see some people in the audience I know and I, they've probably heard this story before, but uh, I have to say, being at MIT for a year, I felt like I was I was the uh, the the basically the dumbest student in every one of my classes. I, I that that is how I felt. Um, you know, very very authentically. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, however, one thing that's really interesting about uh, is I like I learned a little bit of the difference between the culture of being a, a medical student and the culture of being a graduate student. You know, because when the uh, a teacher or when an instructor, when your professor says, uh, do X, Y, and Z, and then the test is in a week, so study up for that, and, and you're a medical student, guess what you do? You do X, Y, and Z, and then you study for that test. I mean, you, you basically, you know, uh, do everything you're asked to, to the letter of the, the law, at least. And um, my colleagues who were brilliant were so so brilliant that they kind of had their own agenda of things they wanted to accomplish uh, intellectually, and it didn't always involve what they had been asked to do in their classes, right? So um, I, I had the recurrent experience of being the obviously least bright person there in terms of technical skills, knowledge. People were tutoring me, and then being amongst the sort of top performers in the class uh, because I'm I was you know very compliant with instructions. So, um, but it was so it was a great year. It, um, it grounded me in cognitive neuroscience in a way that medicine usually doesn't. You know, there's, there's no formal cognitive neuroscience component um, in, in medical education. So I'm really grateful that I had that as part of my, my training. But <laughs> again, the, the feeling that I had when I was an, uh, an RA working for Nancy Canwisher 
it kind of came up again. It, it, you know, I was like, this is all great. This is really intellectually stimulating. Um, I'm not helping anyone. And so, you know, once again, I was sort of driven back this time now sort of feeling feeling my new purpose and sort of realizing that I was I was right the first time. I was right with the choice I made the first time. So I went back to medical school and I, I did I did great. You know, some something clicked, something turned on, and I I sort of um felt somehow more capable of embracing the mantle of being a, a physician um as well as as a scientist. And so so I graduated from medical school having done well finally in those clerkships and um, I matched at the institution that was number one for me and, you know that having gone through a bunch of interviews that I thought was the, the best training program, both in terms of just objectively I thought was the best training program, but also I thought was the best fit. And that place was the University of, of Pennsylvania and um, I did go back to Southern California for an internship. Hey, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with the sort of physician training path, you finish medical school, you do a medical or surgical internship, and then you generally go on to the residency, which is your sort of specialty training. So the internship is a rather generic position, your first year with your MD. Um, and so I did my internship at UCLA because I wanted to be close to my family. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about my family is that my, my father was quite a bit older than my mother when they they got married and um old enough that i i thought it was valuable to spend time with him um because i didn't know how much more time there was going to be and in, indeed he he passed away about 10 years ago so it was it was good that i spent the time there anyway uh i came back to philadelphia to pursue the residency that i already planned on doing two years prior um one thing i'll mention since we're talking about real life stuff is that uh, while I was doing research in the Alvaro Pascual Leone's lab at Harvard, um, I, as a student, uh, formed a relationship with a young RA there, uh, someone who herself has just been a couple years out of college. And um, that person eventually uh, became my wife. Uh, she came out with me to Los Angeles when I did my internship. We weren't married yet. She got a research assistant position there and then she got into graduate school at Drexel University. Uh, and so that was really great, right? Cause we could be in the same city while she pursued her, her graduate uh, education while I was doing my uh, neurology residency, right? And so um, so uh, we've, we've, <laughs> we've been in, in parallel since then with, with one notable exception I'll talk about in a second. Um, and uh, yeah, we have, just to fast forward on on this piece, we have two children, one of whom is 14, one of whom is nine. We live together. She works in at Penn as well as a as a clinical neuropsychologist, um, actually in the clinic where I see patients. So it's it's fantastic. Getting back to my own training pathway. And so then I did my residency in, in neurology here, then behavioral neurology fellowship here, because when I was in residency, I met great, fantastic mentors. Um, the principal one being uh, Branch Coslett, who is a behavioral neurologist here and um, he and I had already been in discussions about building a, a TMS lab, um, transcranial magnetic stimulation lab at Penn. So that was something I already had in my mind as an ambition. So then we uh, we pursued, I pursued my uh, cognitive fellowship here at Penn and, and started doing experiments that had to do with the use of brain stimulation in, um, in healthy individuals, again, to explore structure function relationships. Uh, and also in individuals with, uh, we started to work with individuals with stroke and aphasia uh, as early as 2005 or a little bit after that, 2006, seven, right? And so um, after that, let me say that uh, I pursued fellowship for a couple of years. Um, my, um, my first child was born during, during that fellowship. And then a couple of years, in, uh, then, then after, Good two and a half years of fellowship. I got my, I got a uh, K award. There was a period of time, a short period of time in there where, uh, for those who are clinicians, if anyone is, I was I was transitioned from being what's called a fellow to being an instructor. Uh, just basically meant that I could uh, I had a, attending privileges. I I didn't need to be supervised in order to see patients. Um, has a couple a couple of other implications, but um, that's sort of the big one. 
but then I got my K award and was transitioned to uh, being an assistant professor in 2009. And uh, my K award was to use transcranial direct current stimulation to stimulate the, actually it was to stimulate the um, individuals with, uh, with aphasia as well as individuals with a, a cognitive phenomenon called visual spatial neglect, where you have a tendency to ignore stimuli or uh, bodily sensations or other things on the opposite side of space as your brain lesion. Uh, often happens on the left side. You sort of get your right hemisphere lesion, you ignore the left side of everything. Um, so I was supposed to use uh, TDCS to, to explore those and possibly treat those constructs. Um, I also simultaneously, uh, after checking assiduously with both organizations, um, received a uh, career development award from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for underrepresented minorities. Uh, the, it was the Harold Amos uh, Faculty Development Program. And that was great. And um, I should mention that Branch Coslett was my sort of faculty mentor for both the Harold Amos program and for my K award. And so that award came with a, a fair amount of funding. So between the, the K award and my Harold Amos award, um, my first five years as a faculty member, I was supported almost as if I had a very small R01. So it was, it was really great to have a sort of concurrent awards that um, didn't overlap enough to be you know, problematic with respect to their aims, but but you know, practically in terms of hiring staff and other things that were important, it was great to have sort of dual support. Um, one thing, one life element that I will mention was that um, in my first year as faculty, my uh, the my wife Dawn, she uh, had to do her internship. Now I explained to you very briefly how internships work in medicine. You do your internship and then you do your, sorry, you get your degree, you do your internship, you do your residency, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in neuropsychology and clinical neuropsychology, it's a little bit different. Uh, you, you, you do your graduate training and then you, and you do your internship before you, you actually are handed your, your degree. So she uh, had to do her internship, you know, before she finished up at Drexel. So she, she actually matched um, for her internship at Brown uh, in Rhode Island, which was fortunate because she had a she has a sister, she has one full sister who's up there in Rhode Island, so she could actually stay with her. But it was um, challenging because our son was um, two going on three years old then. Well, it's three years old then, and um, so you know I had to spend my first year as a faculty member away from my uh, from my spouse and from my child. And um, I would take the train up every every weekend. Uh, it was sort of a five and a half to six hour ride each way to, to go and see them. But it was just, um, uh, your first year as faculty is kind of a busy, hard time. And so it was, a I think, a, an especially challenging time to um, suddenly find oneself alone. Uh, <laughs> and and I, uh, I'll never forget the experience of, of telling this to other faculty because it kind of gave me some insight into some of the downsides of being faculty, right? And, and how, it, how sometimes it can it just be a little bit distorted because I, I would explain this to people, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm working really hard now and I'm alone because my wife lives somewhere else now and my son who I love a lot is also you know somewhere else and I get to and, I, and I'm missing him as he's reaching all these milestones and saying all these like great things and just growing I'm, I'm I feel like I'm missing all that and and there was and, and almost universally the response I got from from faculty members was how great it was that I didn't have these distractions during this very important time for me to be productive right which which, you know, I mean, I can, now that I've been faculty for a number of years and been sort of in, sort of steeped in the experience, I could see where one would, you know, have that thought in the back of one's mind. But I, I you know, the, the absence of um, a theory of mind 
that some of these individuals had as to what I was experiencing was 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 jarring to me. All right, so then um, yeah, things things went along. I got my first R01. Um, you know, at the end of my my K award period, that that R01 was actually to explore the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation as a possible. Um, biomarker of neuroplasticity in the brain that could make predictions about uh, how likely or how well one was going to recover from aphasia. Uh, believe it or not, we're still, that was, that, that, that grant ended a, a good number of years ago, several number of years ago, and we're still trying to sort of put out some of the, some of the data from that. So, you know, things, things can, there's, I guess, another lesson, things can take a really long time. And, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the rest, I think, is a fairly canonical story. I mean, over time, we've, I've sort of been building up a um, portfolio of, of, of interests and, and support for various projects, always focusing, uh, to, at least to some extent, on language disorders. I've, I've had the benefit of having a number of really, really great um, trainees uh, particularly uh, in, I think, in my, my postdocs, I've been very fortunate uh, that uh, several of my postdocs have been absolutely outstanding. Um, and um, the way that my lab tends to work, it's a little bit, uh, in my opinion, it's a, I sometimes refer to it as being a little skinny in the middle, which is to say that, it's, that the lab has a number of um, investigators uh, and then there are uh, there are research assistants and uh, sorry there are postdocs. Uh, there's a there's a layer of managers and then there are postdocs and research assistants. I think that because I'm an MD, I have a tendency to it and and most of the PIs in the lab are um, less of a tendency to draw in graduate students, right? And so often the 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 way the lab is structured, a lot of a lot of work ends up being with um, research assistants and the other staff that I just mentioned, and then we tend to draw a lot of undergraduates. And because again, several of us are MDS, um, we tend to draw a lot of individuals who are interested someday in going into medicine. So there's a lot of pre-med undergrads. So that's the general structure. I have I have talked continuously for like, I don't know, 40 minutes. So I, I, I don't know where the time goes. Uh, I, am, I am finally gonna stop and let people ask some questions. I love it. I love, we weren't, none of it is, none of it is gonna interrupt you after 40 minutes, we could have listened for more, but please do feel free to, um, you know, unmute yourself. You don't have to take your camera off uh, or on, you don't have to put your camera on, you can just unmute yourself and shut out or type something in the chat. Sure, I have a question. Hi, Roy. Hey, Darina, how are you? Great, I think this is great because um, you know, usually in the mentor mentee meetings, the meetings tend to center on the mentee. So this is great because I get to listen about your path as well. My question is, as you know, I'm transitioning to a faculty position. So as you reflect when you transitioned from your you know, clinical duties to a faculty member, how do you, can you reflect on sort of that transition and sort of advice you may have for early career scholars in terms of building your program of research or hiring staff or uh, engaging students as you sort of build out that sort of lab, quote unquote. Yeah, um, so that there's a lot, I think. There's, there's a lot in that question. Um, so let me see if I can think of a, just a couple of salient points for, for each of the things that, um, that you mentioned. Uh, I think that one thing that I um, feel like is important, particularly for individuals who are coming from clinical backgrounds who end up going into more research focused backgrounds is um, finding ways to protect their, their, their time and uh, also to um, look for ways to, uh, for some individuals in the transition, depending on what you're working on, to sort of develop the, the skill set that, uh, 
is sort of baked into the work that you want to do. I, you know, I, I found that for me, that ended up being a, a longer um, fellowship than a lot of, uh, of people. And then also I told you about that year at MIT, but I find that, um, you know, sometimes when we're coming from more clinical backgrounds, we have to sort of take the time to, to steep ourselves in specific methodologies because we, we didn't have that opportunity in, um, you know, in what would have well been our, our sort of more basic or translational science backgrounds. Um, I think that one important lesson, maybe one of the most important lessons in making the transition to, to junior faculty that I, I would pass on is uh, the assiduous use of no. <laughs> uh, so, and, and knowing, knowing when is the right, like knowing which yeses are the right yeses and which no's are the right no's, right? And, and which can be challenging. It can be very challenging because you, the, there is, um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities that will come up and um, some of them will seem mission critical and some of them will not seem mission critical and some of them, it will be hard to tell the difference. And so, you know, um, an assiduous ability to say, okay, that's, that, is, that is sort of mission advancing. This is not mission advancing. This is, this is sort of a, 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 just a, an obligation you wanna put on me <laughs> or, or someone even though you know it's got a fancy name to it so it sounds like it might be you know good but but really that's that's what it is this is this thing that you've offered you know there's some way i could turn it into something mission critical if i if i manage it correctly right that 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 thinking about it as opposed to um i, I mean i don't think anyone I don't, I don't want to portray this i don't think anyone really thinks this way but i see people who's thinking kind of veers this way which is yes to most things until their time tightens up and then no to most things because their time is tight, right? And so then, so then they basically become, been uh, indiscriminate with respect to their obligations, responsibilities and time utilization where the, the principal determinant is just how much of the time they have, right? And, and uh, that is not good budget, that is not good budget management with respect to your time when you have so little time for, the, for that sort of critical career development phase. I'll give you one example that um, just to cycle back to some of the hats that I wear that where I just to illustrate this. So, you know, I've been involved in a variety of different diversity, equity and inclusion efforts for a number of years. Anyone who knows me knows that. And um, but I I said no to a bunch of things uh, before I got tenured. Right. Because so, for example, um, somewhere in my fourth year. They wanted to make me just as an example of um, how underrepresented underrepresented individuals are in well, medicine and in my at the time in my department. Uh, you know, there I was in the middle of my assistant professorship. I said, "Well, can you be the the diversity search advisor for your department?" So that means that you'd be on every faculty search to try and you know make sure that they're we're getting more underrepresented faculty and women in the Department of Neurology. I'm like, that is, that is great. That is a fantastic thing to want. And the diversity search advisors have really, you know, that's a great position you've just created. But you know what? I am in my fourth year as an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And, you know, it turns out that the metric they'll be using for me is uh, grants and papers and, you know, other things. So, you know, I'm going to have to decide to, to uh, at, at the very least, kick that can down the road a piece. And so I did. I said, listen, why don't you come back to me after I've been tenured? And so that's, and, and in fact, in fact, just a word about mentorship, uh, uh, Branch Coslet, right, uh, who is, let me say, not an underrepresented minority and a man, uh, said, you know what? I'll be the department's DSA for a couple of years. Why don't you lay off my, my boy here and I'll do this for a while. And, and so he became the department's uh, diverse search advisor until such time as, and, and he, still, uh, he still is, but now, there, now I, I, I'm sort of the sort of subordinate diversity search advisor. When I became uh, 
the uh, an associate professor and then created the position of vice chair and then filled that position. And I was like, okay, now I'm ready, right? Because at, at that point I was in a sort of a less threatened time and, and I, I had more flexibility to choose my priorities, right? And so, so you know, ass assiduous use of yes and assiduous use of no is, is gonna be my, uh, my biggest piece of advice for the, for the junior faculty member. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for talking about your like, background. It's been really interesting to hear. Um, so I, I had a question about, you know, like grad students or people early in their career, like lab managers and stuff, are told to consider um, how difficult it is to be faculty and how difficult the academic career is and everything. And I think you've commented a bit on how you've like wavered exactly or kind of exactly what you want to do and potentially want to uh, consider like a non-academic career or something for the future. I think you mentioned that earlier on. Um, but also how your first year of being faculty, um, you found the culture maybe a bit jarring in a way. So I just sort of was wondering what your opinion is currently on the sort of like the pros and cons of being in acad academia or being like a professor. So um... Let me say that uh, I don't know what what background you're coming at this from. Um, since since you referenced graduate school, I'm assuming you're gonna you're coming at it from the PhD background. Yeah, pre PhD, PhD soon. That that's what you are considering. All right. So you know, I, I think that um, often when I'm having this discussion or these thoughts, uh, I am comparing or when I'm talking to other people about it because of my uh, degree, I'm often talking to people who are considering either a more clinical pathway or a, a um, sort of academic, uh, well, you can be obviously a clinician in an academic center, but like, you know, private practice as a physician. And uh, an analogous comparison would be, you know, working in industry, for example, as someone with a PhD, um, you know, so I, I think there are some points of, of similarity that um, I can touch on. So, so, so there are there are pros to not being in academia. <laughs> Let me say that some of the pros, um, you know, I I have peers who have gone into non-academic science. Um, I've got I certainly have peers who've gone into clinical uh, medicine, but I uh, but also I've got peers who've gone into non-academic science. Uh, there. A, a couple of things that are pros their their work time is circumscribed uh, and uh so you know they 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 may work fewer hours let me just say <laughs> than, than i'm currently working they they in some cases the compensation is uh is better they 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 actually are better salaried than i am for uh for what they do um the the cons you know i i i actually have i generally certainly more than my my colleagues who are in private practice i i have more flexibility you know that that generally speaking and more variety you know that that i do um in the course of my day you know my all, all under the mission of being academic i i think about clinical issues, I think about scientific issues, I think about administrative issues of, of, of sort of a, a big institution and how to how people can excel in it. I think about the diversity of the space just because of the, the role that I play. You know, I, I get to do all this stuff. Every day is interesting and every day is full of, of um, something that I'm happy to do, right? And, and so, um, what I what I often I, I think a summary statement of of my position about why uh, about, of academia pros and cons is I love everything I do I just wish I did about ten percent less of it and I I don't feel like my colleagues who are outside of who stepped out stepped away from academia always say that you know sometimes they the the ones I know uh, I just spent time with a friend who is, he's in a sort of a bit of an existential crisis about what to do because he finds himself kind of 
stalled, a little dead ended in his in his position, you know, he's sort of a staff scientist, um, and doesn't find it, you know, that because because he's no longer in charge of asking the questions, you know, it's not it's not his job per se to be uh, sort of the intellectual innovator, and it doesn't sort of um, his his role doesn't hang on that. Uh, he's, he finds it s somewhat uh, existentially unfulfilling, right? I, I don't have that problem. So, you know, I think there, there are positives and there are negatives. Is there something more concrete? I don't know if I answered your question well. Is there something more concrete that you want to talk about about it? No, I mean, that's great. I, it's good to hear about. <laughs> okay. We are coming up on time. I want to make sure that you get to go, but I actually, yep. because Heather. yes. Uh, it turns out that the thing I had to do at four got got canceled at the last minute. So I, I, okay, I have a good time. Okay, good. Then I won't be cutting off somebody else with my own question, which is um, we have, um, we actually had the benefit of filming Dawn McKenna Hamilton, your wife. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to see the other side of that year at Brown because we heard her side. And so um, she had your son with her. And so she sort of talked about the struggles that she had on that side. Um, and so what, what came through heavily for her story and also a little bit for your story is that the academic environment actually has been kind of difficult place in terms of supporting your family life. So do you think there are things, changes that we can make within the institution that could be more supportive? Um, yes, I mean, I do. I, I think that, I'm sure I could think of many things if you gave me long enough, but I, I wanna just harp on one thing because it's, it's, I've been thinking about it in the context of colleagues and, um, and uh, reflecting on, on how it would have impacted our lives, which is, you know, I've got a number of colleagues who um, are about to have a child. And I think one of the things that was really challenging, and I'm going to say, just, you know, up front, just to be clear, much more challenging for Don than for me. And, and that's actually the point I'm going to drive at is uh, how much more challenging these experiences were for Don than for me. Uh, because uh, both because the parental leave is short, you know, com certainly short, let's say short compared to a Scandinavian nation, but you know, also short in, par in terms of uh, you know, how parents and children really need to connect at the, the first stages of life. But also, um, I don't know if it's the case now, but uh, disproportionate in what's normative between, between the parents. And what I mean by that is, um, and, and this is something that I, I, I regret, um, you know, within the, the birth of, of my children, my two children, I, I was back at work like really soon, really soon. And the thing is, uh, that was probably a bad decision on my part. But what, what is definitely the case is that not once, no one said, hey, what are you doing here? You just, you just had a child, right? The, the answer was, oh, you know, here's the work that built up while you were gone, <laughs> right? Um, glad you're finally back, right? And, and so that's, that is, uh, you know, that, that difference in norms is uh, really actually harmful to, to women and to men, right? To say, okay, we're, we're not actually gonna make it normative for you to, to spend more time making the situation easier for everyone or contributing and, and being a sort of equal partner in, um, in the ra raising of your child at one of their most critical moments, right? Is, uh, I, I think, is terrible. Uh, and so uh, that that is one thing I wish that the university, you know, now, now that I see, I've seen it in a number of my peer colleagues. I've I've, I've now seen a number of of um, you know new fathers coming back 
it's, it's, it feels like minutes after their child's born. I'm like, I know someone is, is going through the hardest moments of their life right now at, at your house, right? Um, it's something that I wish the university enforced more, more clearly. That's helpful to hear. It's um, yeah, it's like, let's see the baby picture. And now what does your schedule look like for tomorrow for? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, cute baby. Yeah. Next, yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Can I ask another question? Uh, so Roy, you I think you definitely have a gift uh, for mentoring. So how do you, were there any resources or things you thought about as you began mentoring? Because mentoring is a part of sort of a faculty position or faculty role. Do you have any suggestions on how to become a really good mentor? Well, um, I, I think there are uh, certainly resources for for teaching mentoring. Um, so I, you know, Penn, for example, has training courses for, for mentoring. And it's, it's often the case that, you know, societies will have, scientific societies will have these kinds of things too. So I, I, I would recommend investing time in that. Having said that, um, I'm not sure that I, I don't think I did that. <laughs> um, I, I, part of, I, I I think that, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for saying that about me. Uh, I think that part of my philosophy actually comes, I, you know, I, I spent some time, I didn't mention this, you know, one of the things I did was I was a, a, a teacher for a little bit. So, you know, and both on, on campus at, at Harvard as sort of a student teacher, and then a little bit afterwards, um, actually during that time when I was also working for Nancy Kamwisher. So um, I think uh, part of the mindset has to do with an investment in the, the mentee. I mean, I think too many mentors, quote unquote mentors, uh, especially when their, their, their student or their postdoc is uh, engaged in work that is beneficial for their um, specific projects and programs, they, they think of the trainee as a vehicle for getting the work done, right? And, and that is, that is entirely the wrong relationship to have with your, your mentee, right? With, when you work with a mentee, um, the relationship is to advance the mentee, right? That, that um, it, it's, uh, it's and, and then if they're working on your work, then you benefit as a um, an, a side benefit, you know. It's sort of a it, that's the dividend it pays, right? And it, it tends to be the case. In fact, is as long as you're focusing on okay, you know, my mentee needs to hit these benchmarks, and and you know, this is what we sort of agree they need in terms of their productivity, the skill set they need to develop, um, a sort of a strategic plan for what's down the road for them. You know, and and if we can accomplish that, that that generally will accomplish more for the lab than if I said I'm not going to focus on your needs at all. Please, please just do the things that would advance my career by being the you know the author of the papers that I'll be the the, the final author of, right? So I think that um, that the the heart of it is a kind of of golden ruleism, right? Like you know, I mean you you. You, um, you treat you treat your mentees the way that you would have hoped to have been treated when you were in that similar stage, with the idea that you, you have a responsibility as their as their teacher and guide. And I, and I think a, a a big part of that for me is that um, because I came from a background where I had no sort of baked in implicit knowledge about what the road is like. You know, I, I, I had no idea, uh, literally none, what, um, what medical school was gonna be like, what residency was gonna be like. I didn't, I didn't know what it was gonna be like to be a professor. I didn't know what it was like to, gonna be a fellow, like you name it, right? And there's so much extra work, just there's so much extra work acquiring the process knowledge in addition to, to then doing the, the thing, right? That uh, if, if you could just lower the burden of process knowledge for people, 
you know, make, make it so that it's it's easier it, it's easier for them to know what the path is supposed to be like, right? I think that's that's really I think it's really important, you know. And I, I think that it's part of what motivates me as a um, in some of my other work too, some of my diversity work because I'm really interested in lowering the barriers of process knowledge for other people, you know, who come from advanced, from backgrounds where it's very unlikely that they would have this experience to to call upon, and I think it that sort of seeps into my mentoring philosophy as well. I will just jump in and say that I know Roy has a fantastic reputation as a mentor because he takes so many um, undergraduates that I then get to hear through the through the back door um, from about what it's like to be in his lab. Um, and I just I second the, also the um, the idea of lowering the barrier by making the process more transparent. Um, I, you know, I, I, I fell into research as an undergraduate and accidentally happened upon mentors who helped me um, get where I am. And I, I would just say that, yes, if they had not invested in me, that, um, you know, and maybe that comes second nature almost as researchers, like you invest in the process instead of the product. And so if you invest in the process, then the product will come. Um, but yes, I would say the, the, the mentorship aspect of, of, if you get into it thinking, oh, this is gonna greatly advance my research agenda, right? First of all, that's sometimes laughable depending on the stage of the student that you're engaging, <laughs> but also, um, right, uh, just not not ultimately sort of what, I would say that's probably also one of the differences between being in academia and not, right? If you're, do, if you're here, hopefully you're invested in the pedagogical process and instead of just the, um, and that's one of the ways you can help people more directly instead of just the, the money or the, the, the time or the whatever other exchanges you feel like you're making. Um, so that just, that really resonates um, with me. And I'm grateful to have people like, like you on the faculty who are invested in this way. Are there any other questions before we sign off on this final final behind the CV series of uh, uh, session for this year. All right, well, I will um, lead us in a little virtual round of applause and say thank you very much um, for sharing your, your story in this, um, what I've become referring to as a brave face <laughs> because it's not always pretty. Uh, and I uh, hope everyone's, uh, if you're on this kind of academic schedule, if your, your semester or whatever uh, wraps up well. And uh, we hope to see you back again uh, next year, except for those of you who are heading into Brave New Worlds. All right, thank you. It was great. And uh, I'm so happy to have given the, your uh, ultimate talk for the year. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wish you all well and take care. Thanks, Roy. Really appreciate it. All right, take care now. Bye-bye. Ah, so great. Let me stop.